religious merit. That was, and I hope still is, Professor Allier. Now, Professor Hubert N. Allier is from Princeton University, and his course on chemistry is one of the most popular courses there. Its official title, I believe, is called Chemical Concepts. But today, we've asked uh, Professor Allier to talk to us about power, all kinds of power, but especially atomic power. I want to tell you also that Professor Allier is a research chemist of the first rank. But what is just as important to us, the things he does have a kind of magic to them. Oh, uh, Professor Allier, I, I, you know, I've seen pictures of your lecture on atomic energy, and they look to me like you're a magician. Oh, magician. No magic? magic? No, no magic at all. No, no magic at all. No magic at all. No magic. No magic. <laughs> wow. No more magic than the burning of this paper. Now, and then the paper begins to burn, as you see, begins to combine with oxygen in the air. Now, the paper is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And as it burns, it forms carbon dioxide and water. This is a simple chemical reaction. In fact, you can see that white paper turning into black carbon. Now, I'm going to do another experiment, this time with a piece of wood. We'll take the piece of wood and set fire to it. And as the wood begins to burn, we see another chemical reaction. As a matter of fact, the wood turns black. And actually, you catch the gases that come off. You find there carbon dioxide and water. And then pretty soon you say, well, I guess uh, the wood, too, is made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Begin to think that the burning of the paper, the burning of wood are very similar reactions. And then you remember that, after all, they make uh, the uh, paper out of wood pulp. And so do the chemists, the burning of the paper or the wood are very similar chemical reactions. Uh, now I'm going to do another experiment, uh, this time uh, with a lump of sugar. I'm going to take this lump of sugar and burn it. I'm going to take it and eat it. Oh, I'd like to do this experiment. Now, when the sugar gets down inside of me, the same things are going to happen to it that happen to this paper and wood. Oh, I'm not going to turn off black and give off smoke and fumes, but tomorrow, when I need energy, I'm going to burn up that sugar. Then the sugar will begin to burn, uh, just as the paper or the wood would burn, you see, and give off, a, uh, well, actually give off energy inside of me. And as the paper or the wood burns, so the sugar inside of me begins to burn, as the paper forms carbon dioxide and water, so inside of me, uh, the sugar will begin to burn, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, the sugar will burn. I'll breathe in some oxygen, it gets down into my lung, down where my blood is, down to where the sugar is, and it'll burn to form carbon dioxide, which I breathe out, and water which I perspire. And so you see, the burning of that sugar inside of me isn't very much different from the burning of the paper of the wood in the eyes of a chemist. As a matter of fact, uh, it might be interesting to learn a little bit more about these chemical substances. Carbon dioxide, that's ordinary dry ice, the stuff you see here. Uh, so that stuff there is pretty cold. You have to be awfully careful because it's about 80 degrees below zero. But we'll take some off it. You see this dry ice. And I say, you see, I'm very careful with that. I might <laughs> warn you, Mr. Marley, don't you ever try it. You young people, don't you ever try to put this dry ice in your mouth. You have to be an expert chemist and know just how to handle it because you can get a very serious burn with it. But the dry ice is cold, as I say. It's the stuff that's bubbling here. It's a, uh, a very cold material. In fact, this dry ice or carbon dioxide is the stuff that you have in a fire extinguisher. When you have a fire, you try to blanket out the fire with this dry ice. <laughs> That's the stuff you breathe out. You breathe out carbon dioxide and dry ice. That's the CO2. As a matter of fact, you might look at this too, the water, H2O. Uh, that's formed by the burning of hydrogen and oxygen to give us the water. Never mind about the twos and things. That just shows we're, we're chemists. But at any rate, I got a pop bottle here, and uh, we're going to have the hydrogen and oxygen combine to form water in it. So we take the gases in the pop bottle, the hydrogen and oxygen will combine, and we'll give it water. <laughs> I'm sorry, I warned you it was a top pop bottle, and, and uh, here's the water that formed when it uh, combined. <laughs> Professor, can I interrupt? Why yeah. did that uh, make an explosion and the others didn't? Well, that was because it reacted so rapidly. You see, if any reaction reacts rapidly, it's an explosion. In fact, even such a simple reaction as the burning of a candle could be an explosive reaction if it only went fast enough. Uh, let's uh, see if we can uh, make a candle explode. We take the candle here, we light it, and oxygen from the air comes down. The candle burns slowly. But, oh, if we can only get, the, oh, we put this in pure oxygen, for example. Get more air to it. How can we get more air to it? Well, one of the easiest ways is to burn your candle at both ends. If you burn your candle at both ends, the air gets to it 
twice as fast. If you burn your candle at both ends, it'll burn up in half the time. Why, right, Mr. Merrill, you know where else? If you burn your candle at both ends, you're only going to live half as long. But it's more than twice the fun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's take this and break it up to a thousand little candles. A thousand little candles burn out a thousand times. A million little candles, there'll be an explosion. So let's do that. Let's, well, it'll take too long to break it up in a million little candles. So I brought some flour along here. We'll take this flour and we'll show you that it can explode. Now, this is the principle of a dust explosion in flour mills. The $4 million worth of flour mills blown up uh, by just ordinary household flour. We're going to put it down inside of this milk can. There's a little funnel down there. Now it's in the funnel there. And now, if I squeeze this bulb, the flour will blow up there, but it won't catch fire because you have to have a spark. You know, if you go into a flour mill, you're very careful not to make a spark if you do, you come out to the roof instead of the door. Uh, so that actually, I'll, I'll make a, uh, I'll light a candle down there. There's a spark now. The candle's burning, the flower's down there. Now when I squeeze this, the flower will come up, and every little piece of flower will burn a minute of a second. It'll be a fast reaction, it'll be an explosion. So here we are, one, two, three. It's just ordinary flower. Now, uh, you're probably disappointed. You wanted a pop and a boom, didn't you? Yeah. All right. Well, put the doing that way. I'll we'll take you. I'm going to put the top one in. We'll let the gases get away. Otherwise, it'll be exactly the same reaction. To we'll take, oh, about a half a teaspoonful of flour is the recipe I use in there. And then uh, I guess we'll light the, uh, uh, here, we're lighting the uh, candle there. And now, as I say, I'm going to put the top on here. And it'll give off energy. It'll give it off fast. There we are. One, two, three. Oh, so you could see, yeah. oh. see what happens when the flower burns fast. Now, that's the principle of an explosion. But you notice it gave off a lot of energy. And that's true of most of our chemical reactions. Energy comes off in different amounts. Uh, for example, if you uh, burn a match, uh, you get off a, a certain amount of energy. Uh, a whole box of matches burning will give off about four electron volts of energy. Uh, four electron volts. <laughs> for the ladies, that's 100,000 calories. Four electron volts of energy come off. Uh, here's an interesting little chemical factory that gives off about a volt and a half. It's a flashlight battery. And when you put this in your flashlight and press the button, a chemical reaction occurs inside of there and gives you about a volt and a half. In other words, I want to get the idea, you see, of a couple volts of energy involved in these reactions. If you have a three volt uh, bulb, well, you put two of these inside of your battery. So uh, we have then, in other words, a picture of a certain amount of energy coming off. Uh, now, uh, it might be interesting for you to see one that gives off almost as much energy as TNT. When TNT explodes, you actually get off about 15 electron volts. And uh, in other words, in this range of a few electron volts, and this reaction here is going to give us off about uh, 10 electron volts. But it'll give uh, uh, perhaps too much energy for the, the camera. So I think perhaps I'll ask the cameraman to come in here and we'll let him put these filters uh, uh, over the camera Good across idea. this. This won't show up quite so well then, but um, we better protect those anyway. Anyway, here we have something that's going to react and give off almost as much energy as TNT. Now, it'll go uh, and give it off, uh, but it won't give it off fast enough to be explosive. <laughs> At least it never has until right this minute. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll take this uh, uh, starting mixture. We're going to put some starting mixture in here. And then on top of the starting mixture, uh, we're going to put uh, something to start the starter. And then when that's all ready, I'm going to put something to start the starter, to start the starter, to start the mixer going. When it finally goes, molten iron will be generated in here, and it'll drop down through a hole here in the crucible, and molten iron will, will dash all over you. Uh, matter of fact, I think uh, for safety, I'm going to put this uh, can down inside here for the molten iron to dash into. So now we're going to see what happens uh, when 10 electron volts comes off. I'm going to get the... A uh, fire extinguisher here for absolute safety. And, all right, here we are. You're going to see 10 electron volts, almost as much as TNT. Here we go. Watch for the molten iron. Watch for the molten iron to come down. Here it comes. Molten iron. Molten iron dropping down. At 10 electron volts now. 10 electron volts. Matter of fact, if you listen very carefully, you'll actually hear. Uh, the, the water boiling there. Listen carefully. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it's actually boiling here. We might take this out now and see. Uh, it's still red hot. You can see it's red hot. It's boiling in here. And actually, uh, you can see here, a tremendous amount of energy has come off. Uh, and a uh, um, whole eaten right to the pan here. That's 10 electron volts. That's the kind of energy that comes off from chemical reactions uh, such as you've seen. But then there's another uh, explosive you might be interested in, uh, trinitrotoluene, or TNT. 
Uh, this is a, a model of what it looks like. It's a ring of carbons, and here's some carbon and hydrogen. And then at three places, there are NO2s or nitros. That's why it's trinitro toluene. And uh, when uh, this ex uh, explodes, uh, you don't have to wait for the oxygen to come down because it has the oxygen in it already. And so it will quickly. As they say, anything that goes quickly like that will be an explosion. So that's the way TNT explodes. May I ask you, is that the same principle as when an A-bomb explodes? Well, uh, sort of the same principle, but uh, uh, the A-bomb gives off energy, gives off fast, but it's an entirely different kind of reaction. Uh, because uh, if you look at the, these chemical reactions we saw over there, uh, they reacted uh, in this way, that here were chemical elements. They reacted to give you compounds which contain the chemical elements. Now, there were 98 different chemical elements in the world, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nickel, copper, sulfur, gold, all these different things. And uh, we're all made up of these chemical elements, except for the girls, they're made up of sugar and spice and everything nice. But the, the, <laughs> the rest of us are made up of these. And actually, <laughs> there's no difference between Mer me and Marilyn Monroe, except her chemical elements happen to be raised a better advantage. <laughs> <laughs> and so these chemical elements, you see, are combining to give compounds, and that's a chemical reaction. But uh, with the atom <coughs> bomb reaction, something entirely different happens. Instead of chemical elements reacting, one chemical element changes over into another chemical element. Why, you say, that's fantastic. That's transmutation. That's what the alchemist did when he tried and somehow or other to make lead into gold. You mean to say that the story of the atom bomb is the story of the alchemist? Yes, it goes back to the Middle Ages to that weird old fellow in his cave bending over the hieroglyphics and the skeleton, trying in some way or other to make lead into gold, little realizing when he succeeded in this, our generation, we'd have the atom bomb with all the problems that would come with it. Because actually, when a uranium bomb goes off, uh, something like this happens. Let's say we have a lump of uranium with billions and billions of uranium atoms. This is a single uranium atom now. And we're going to shoot a particle called a neutron at it. And when it's going at the right speed and hits this uranium atom, that one neutron splits the uranium atom into two parts. And But more exciting than that, splits it into two other atoms. You also hit the jackpot, you get three more uh, of these neutrons back. This is what happens when an atom bomb goes off. And when it does go off, uh, it gives tremendous amount of energy off because when it goes off, a certain amount of matter is changed into energy. Uh, actually, uh, just the tiniest bit of matter will give us tremendous energy when, for example, out of bikini, uh, they exploded uh, a uranium, about this amount of uranium under water. Uh, the explosion blew five million tons a mile into the air, but that amount of uranium reacted but only the weight of about half a postage stamp was all that was destroyed, and the destruction of that amount of matter gave enough energy to raise that water a mile into the air. So you see the A-bomb gives a tremendous amount of energy. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, if we put this down here and compare it with TNT, about the same uh, weight of an A-bomb will give off about 200 million electron volts. And if you forget everything I've told you, I hope you'll never to your dying day forget those two figures because they tell you the difference between TNT and an A-bomb. They tell you that 15 tons of uranium are theoretically, at least, as dangerous as 200 million tons of TNT. They tell you, for example, that that much uh, uh, uranium, that's very heavy, it weigh about half a ton, that much uranium could deliver as much destruction as all the TNT dropped by all the airplanes during all of World War II. Uh, or to put it another way, suppose you had raids on all the cities of the world, tonight, 2,000 planes all carrying uranium bombs. There aren't that many bombs, but there will be someday. And these, these planes, in a single night, perhaps in a half hour, drop their loads on 2,000 cities. And now contrast that with planes carrying TNT. How many nights would they have to fly? And the answer is, you'd have to have 2,000 planes flying night after night for 30 years. And that's a very conservative estimate. That's based on the Japanese bombs and the modern bombs are, are far worse than that. Well, uh, very often people ask me, uh, when these tremendous bombs go off, will the whole world blow up? And, uh, of course, the answer is that uh, it'll no more blow up than the whole world will burn up when I light this match. When I light the match, there's a definite chemical reaction that burns along. The cellulose of the match combines oxygen in the air. After the match is all burned up, it goes out. Exactly the same thing with an atom bomb. There's a definite amount of uranium. There's a very definite reaction. The definite reaction is that uh, a neutron is going to hit the uranium, as we had it down here, and it's going to split up into a couple of particles, X plus Y, and you're going to get three neutrons off, 
having started with one over here, and then you're going to get this 200 million electron volts off. In other words, you see, this definite reaction, a definite amount of uranium takes place, and when it's all over, just like the burning of the match, it's over and the world won't blow up. So, uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh, the story of the A-bomb, and I suppose you know uh, everything about uranium now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know more than I did. Now, uh, uh, may I ask you about the H-bomb? Now, is the H-bomb just a giant A-bomb? No, it's, it's entirely different. It's entirely different. When, when the uranium bomb goes off, you remember I just told you that the big atoms in there split into two other elements uh, and atoms. But when uh, an H-bomb goes off, this is called fission, because they fission, go in two, uh, like biological fission. But with an H-bomb, two little atoms come together to form a helium. Now, you can have either hydrogen or double heavy hydrogen or triple heavy hydrogen, tritium that's made down in Savannah River Project. Any of those coming together will give off energy and tremendously more energy, at least a couple of hundred times more energy than the A-bomb. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking now of one of the uh, HH reactions in which you get a four billion electron volts off uh, from this H-bomb. In other words, you see, an H-bomb can, uh, uh, the, the A-bomb can destroy just a little city, but the H-bomb to destroy a large city. Uh, would, would you like to see an H-bomb go off? <laughs> would I like to see yeah. one go off? No, <laughs> well, not right this minute. Well, you can. Uh, All you have to do is go outside and look up at the sun. And there, 92 million miles away, hydrogen is combining to form helium. About uh, 5 million tons of hydrogen every minute are combining to give helium, giving off this tremendous energy. As a matter of fact, the sun's about a third burned up. We're told it's about 4 billion more years to go. Maybe it's 400 billion years. It makes you feel any better. But at any rate, it's burning up, giving off this energy, and you can give thanks that you're 92 million miles away, and that life-giving light is coming down to you, and that is all. But unfortunately, we still have H-bombs with us today. <laughs> Professor, now can all this knowledge be used for peaceful purposes? Yes, uh, we can use it for peacetime as well as uh, for bombs. For example, here is an ordinary furnace, uh, just a coal furnace. And as you know, to make this coal furnace burn, we can put uh, coal into the furnace and the uh, furnace gives us off heat. Over here, we have an atom bombs furnace. It's called a nuclear reactor. And uh, this particular reactor has thousands of little holes, and into those holes you put uranium. Just as you put the coal into this kind of a furnace, you can take and put slugs of uranium actually in aluminum cans like this. You put them, and here are the holes blown up from here. You put those into here, and this will give you off tremendous heat, uh, just like the burning of coal. Only instead of giving off four, you see it's going to give off 200 million. And so tremendous energy will come off from this. As a matter of fact, so this doesn't explode, one of the tricks is to push rods into here, which will prevent the thing from getting out of control. So here is a furnace using uranium, just as here is a furnace using coal. So we have two different kinds of furnaces. As a matter of fact, there are over 30 of these have been built this side of the Iron Curtain. So you see, they're pretty common things. And uh, over in Harwell, England, for example, the heat that comes out of that was used to heat 80 rooms in a nearby laboratory. And the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission uh, actually uh, used one of these piles to generate electricity out in Idaho, lighted uh, a light electric light. And uh, just last Thursday, it was announced that the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission is going to build one of these piles to generate electricity about a 60,000 kilowatt, uh, a 60 kilowatt, uh, a pile that will take care of about 60,000 to 100,000 people uh, electrically uh, because of this energy, this tremendous energy that's coming off. Uh, actually, also, we heard that just uh, uh, yesterday they had the last inspection uh, before the final test next year, probably the uh, submarine, Nautilus, uh, a submarine with one of these piles inside of it to operate entirely on this. Uh, to give you an idea how much energy comes off from that, I might say that that uh, in one such a pile as this, about that amount of uranium a day, about that amount of uranium a day will give you about the same electrical energy as uh, the, uh, the, uh, Grand, uh, Cooley, uh, the Hoover Dam. Uh, the Boulder Dam, with that amount of uranium disappearing a day, uh, only competes with the pile, you see, in a way that, that tells you the tremendous energy that comes off. Uh, I might tell you how that pile works, too. Uh, this pile, as I said, is a big pile of carbon or graphite. And uh, all throughout that pile are these little cans of uranium. And now, what's the function of the graphite? Well, this. Uh, there are a couple of reactions that can occur in there. One is this one that gives off a lot of energy. Uh, the other reaction is a reaction where uranium might react to give plutonium. 
entirely different reaction and not very much energy. Now, if you want this reaction to occur, uh, you use this pile for the following reason. That the, the neutrons that make this reaction go are called slow neutrons. They're moving very slowly. Uh, the neutrons that come off are very fast neutrons. And the neutrons that cause the plutonium reaction are relatively fast, not very slow. Now then, suppose that you have uh, uh, some of these neutrons being generated, and you have graphite around them. As the neutrons go through the graphite, they're slowed down. And we're told that when they've gone through about 40 centimeters of graphite, about that far, they will be slowed down to this stage so that this reaction will occur. So the graphite is used to slow down the neutrons to make this reaction that gives off the energy come off. Now, you can have a graphite or you can have a, pi a, p a, a pail of heavy water. Uh, heavy water would do exactly the same thing. Instead of piles of graphite, a tank of heavy water it would slow down the reaction. That's how heavy water comes into the story. So, you see, uh, the power aspect of this is very interesting. But then there's something even more fascinating than that, and that is if into this pile uh, you place uh, various chemical elements, in these little holes here, right near the big holes, uh, you put some phosphorus, for example, in this hole, the, the neutrons that are being given off hit the phosphorus and change it into radioactive sulfur. And as a matter of fact, here it's, uh, it's clicking here, you see. You put sulfur in here, phosphorus comes out, radioactive phosphorus, and you'll get clicking like this on this Geiger counter. This Geiger counter will pick up this radioactivity. And a doctor can use this radioactive phosphorus in this way. If he, four hours before he operates for a brain tumor, he'll inject uh, the phosphate solutions that he's gotten from the Atomic Energy Commission down at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They ship it up to him. He injects it into the patient, and it uh, courses through the body of the patient, goes up to where his tumor's tissue is. And uh, it, it's absorbed quicker in the tumor's tissue than the natural tissue. So he goes around with a Geiger counter just before the operation, puts in here, no clicks, nothing there at all, nothing here at all. But right here, click, click, click. Ah, there's the tumor. Click, oh, there's the tumor. From the number of clicks, he can find out just where the tumor is, how big it is, before he ever cuts a hole in your head. Uh, this, this is the kind of thing you can do. Uh, then there's a the story of radioactive cobalt. Up in Canada, they have a heavy water pile where they put ordinary cobalt into the pile and it uh, begins to react and generates from cobalt 59. It makes it weigh 60 and it's radioactive. As uh, a matter of fact, I read in the paper uh, a few months ago about a shipment to the University of Michigan. Uh, from Canada, where the radioactivity of that cobalt was greater than all the radium that's been mined since Madame Curie uh, produced. As a matter of fact, since Madame Curie first produced radium, uh, we've had about four pounds of radium for medical research. Uh, but since Oak Ridge has sent out from things manufactured in the pile, not just radium, but far more interesting, phosphorus and sulfur and sodium and iron and all these things, they have shipped out the equivalent, uh, uh, not of four pounds, but the equivalent of two million pounds of radio radium equivalent. So, you see, it's a tremendous future before us. The peacetime future is indeed encouraging. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the military picture still dominates the scene. Ah, now, how do we know, so may I ask, uh, how do we know that the Russians have the A-bomb, the spies? Well, by a very simple t technique. If I take and pass my hand over here, You know why I correct? I think I do. You have some radioactive That's uh, right. material. That's right. there. Now, yeah. and exactly the same thing happens if out in Nevada, there's an explosion out there on the Nevada flats. Uh, dust grow, blows around the world, and, and uh, there are 121 listening stations the United States has all over the United States catching the dust that fall. They catch them on little pieces of paper like this, and little squares of paper. And uh, if uh, a radioactive cloud blows over, then the paper, instead of being like this, will begin to act up. Uh, and they know now that there have been a radioactive cloud. Actually, uh, if you explode a bomb this morning out there in the Nevada Flats, it'll reach New York oh, late tomorrow or a little after that. And when the clicking comes, from the number of clicks and from the way the clicks die away. Uh, you can tell how big the bombs are, what the chemicals are in them, and this is the way, uh, by measuring these clicks, that we're able to tell uh, whether the Russians have and other people have exploded these bombs. Now, like I said, if Russia should ever catch up or even surpass us in this fearful race, what should be done about that? Well, we have to, of course, first of all, realize that this is a problem uh, which involves not necessarily a great many secrets. The real secret of the atom bomb 
uh, was uh, the industrial know-how. Uh, Sixty years of industrial technical know-how went in to making the atom bomb. And when finally the bombs were exploded, uh, this was something that reflected tremendous technology in our country. And so the real secret is this industrial know-how. And other nations will someday learn it. So we've got to do something about it. Uh, we can't wait. Uh, we've got to start working for peace today. Peace will come only when we understand people in other lands. Peace will come only when we spend as much money on understanding people as uh, we spend on making atom bombs. Every time we give a natural scientist a dollar to do research on uh, atomic energy and bombs, uh, we should appropriate to the political and social scientists a dollar. We ought to match it a dollar for dollar so that the political and social scientists uh, should be able to work out a plan for peace in a world in which we're making atom bombs. Uh, this is a very serious problem. The political scientist must realize that his job has as much dignity as that as a natural scientist. Here I am, a natural scientist, uh, pleading for the humanities. And it's awfully important that in some way or other uh, we learn how to make a world safe to live in. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to come overnight. It's only going to come with earnest, hard labor on the part of our political and social science people taking off their coats and working like scientists to work to find out how to get people to understand one another better. And then at last, perhaps because of the urgency of it all, brought on by the reality of the atom bomb, atomic energy, weapon for peace, perhaps we'll increase the efforts of people to understand one another. Perhaps it'll lead to a world in which we have not only peace and goodwill amongst men, but under an international law and order, we may look forward at last to peace among men of goodwill. That was an experience that uh, I won't forget. Now, I wanted to remind you that on all our excursions, you know, we get some very interesting souvenirs. And this week, we have a particularly interesting one which Professor Allier is going <coughs> to give us. Here's a replica of the atomic pile, or the so-called nuclear reactor. I thought, perhaps you'd like that, Mr. Morgan. Well, I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you one more favor. You're a chemist, and you know that we have a sweet potato that we're growing in kind of a race with the audience here. Now, there's that sweet... I wonder if you knew any particular chemicals that would make my <laughs> potato grow faster than theirs. Well, I, I could give you some plant hormones oh, that would make it. A plant hormones yeah. they are, but I, would, I don't believe I really should, Mr. Merritt. I don't think it's fair to take advantage of the people out there. Oh, I think you're right. I was only fooling. Thank you very much. Well, thank it was you, It very too, thrilling. Sir. And thank you for this, uh, which we'll now put away right there. And we've had some very interesting souvenirs on these excursions. Is that all? potato, and ah, yes, do you remember this microscope which George Schwartz gave us? That was our excursion into a drop of water. Remember that so well? Ah, here's the baseball Carl Erskine gave us, and what's this? Ah, yes, Roland Lestarza gave us these boxing gloves, if you remember. And here is the Tremaine Cup, which reminds me that next Sunday we're going to have the third and final episode Johnny Tremaine. So, now, what? Well, I don't seem to recognize this. What's this? I don't know what this... Ah, oh, yes, I think so. If I can find it, there's the little rabbit. And that means that we're going to have a magician with us. His name is Jay Marshall. He's quite a wonderful magician. So I'll see you next week. Huh? Say hello. So long.